Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Chris Hyams, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next episode of Here to Help. This is our look at how Indeed has been navigating the global impact of COVID-19. Today is October 4th. We're on day 580 of global work from home. Since 2015 at Indeed, we have been running an immersive innovation program for our new college grads in technology that we call Indeed University, or IU for short. And IU has three primary objectives. First, to instill our core value of data-driven decision-making, not through listening and reading, but through building and launching new products and technology to help people get jobs. Second, as a leadership development program for rising stars in our tech organization who serve as the leads and deans of IU. And third, to solve real problems and build new innovative technology. Last week, Indeed U 2021, our seventh cohort, wrapped up. And this year, for the first time, the focus of Indeed U was on helping Indeed with our own hiring. My guest today is Lori Williams, a senior product manager at Indeed. And Lori was a lead last year for Indeed U 2020. And this year was one of the two deans responsible for Indeed U 2021. Lori, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Let's start off where we always start these conversations by uh, asking you, how are you doing today right now? Uh, Chris, I'm amazing. Uh, so IU wrapped up. Uh, we um, All our participants have their placements and I go on PTO tomorrow. And so it's a really good day for me. That is fantastic to hear. Well, let's uh, start. We're going to talk a lot about Indeed University, but let's talk a little bit about your job at Indeed and how day to day you help people get jobs. Yeah, for sure. So outside of Indeed University, I am normally uh, attached to um, uh, internal platforms. And my journey at Indeed started with uh, a business unit called Revenue Systems and Re Revenue Systems. Uh, they essentially manage the billing uh, for uh, some of our paid services. Um, Rev Systems, like a lot of uh, business units and, and IP is going through this really cool uh, transition right now uh, where we have this great uh, system that worked perfectly for what we needed it to at the time. And now that we have grown, um, we have to sort of re-architect and kind of break down the monolith so that we are um, able to scale the business. After that, uh, I spent some time on CRM, uh, which comes up a lot in your Q and A's. And um, they are also going through the same thing, right? So we had this awesome uh, homegrown platform named Ad Central, and it worked perfect for what we needed it to at the time. But now we've gotten so big that we have to sort of move over to something that is more scalable. And so uh, one of the things uh, that you'll often hear uh, in internal platforms is we help the people that help the people get jobs. Uh, and um, so we do that by um, making our systems scalable so that we can continue to grow so that we can help more people get jobs. So um, in my intro, I mentioned that you were the dean of Indeed University this year. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about mm -hmm. what Indeed University is and, and what is the job of the dean? Yeah, sure. So uh, Indeed University is a 12-week uh, um, project-based onboarding program uh, for new uh, college grads. For a lot of them, um, this is their first job. Uh, they already have a skill set, right? So like as an example, for an engineer, they already know how to code, so we're not teaching them anything like that. Um, what we are teaching them, though, is some of our values and principles um, at Indeed. Um, so how do we make data-driven decisions? How do we think about um, problems? So within those 12 weeks, uh, we give them a theme or sort of a problem area, uh, which this year was uh, internal hiring. Um, they have that time to sort of um, uh, do their own research, you know, do some, you know, sit with some users and then uh, each uh, cross-functional team, so we had nine of them this year, uh, gets to decide what specific problem space they want to focus on. Uh, they come up with their hypothesis around this, and then they get to spend the rest of the time uh, trying to sort of prove that out or to learn that, um, you know, maybe th this wasn't the right direction, and, but, but we learned a thing. Um, the biggest goal of IU is to learn. 
you only fail if you fail to learn. There is no real failing. Uh, we actually love it when people fail because that means that uh, that you've learned something. Um, as the dean, um, so I work a lot with those teams, uh, and I work a lot with the um, with the leads this year, which is a little bit different than than last year, where I focused specifically on the teams that I was assigned to. Uh, this year, I have the cool opportunity of also being able to work more directly with some of the the new leaders that we have at Indeed. So you were a, a lead last year, which meant that you were responsible for for a couple of teams. You um, you came back as as the dean this year, uh, along with your your partner Rahul, um, running the entire program. Last year was an incredibly challenging Indeed University. So we were kicking this off really in in the the early days of the pandemic. We ended up um, delaying the start, and moving it back because we we had no idea how we were going to get people to work together. We had to figure out how to run this program that had been an immersive cohort, throw everyone in the same room together for 12 yeah. weeks and do it all remotely with people still living in their parents' basements or wherever they were. Um, and after all of that, you decided to come back and, and do it all over again this year. Yeah. Can you talk about how the, the pandemic changed the, the work of Indeed University and how it was structured? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll answer your first question first, which is, um, why did I come back? And the short answer is that uh, I love Indeed University. I want to tell you my favorite thing about it, which is that, um, and we don't talk about this a lot, but this program builds confidence. Uh, it builds confidence for participants. Oftentimes, this is their their first job, right? And they, you know, they're obviously, you know, top performers, uh, or they wouldn't be here in Indeed. And but, like, you know, if you think back to your first job. Um, you're probably a little bit nervous, a little bit vulnerable. And we create this safe environment um, for them where they can learn and grow. And it's this really cool transformation uh, for the participants where you see them come in and they're a little bit shy and they're a little bit shaky. And then by the end of the program, they're just like so smooth and so confident. And uh, this year, I also got a chance to work with the leads where you see the same thing. A lot of the leads this is the first time they have ever um, uh, been a people manager, led people, right? And kind of the same thing, right? Like, so, um, you know, Raul and I looked for certain signals when hiring, right? Like we wanted people that were compassionate, empathetic, and that got a lot of joy from seeing others uh, grow and seeing uh, success through others. And so it's really cool to kind of see them, you know, like everyone's nervous, the first day jitters, right? Um, but then by the end of it, they're just like so confident. And that's a, a really uh, cool feeling. Um, as far as your, your second question, um, how did the pandemic change the work um, we were doing and how IU was structured? Um, so to your point, um, we used to all sort of like fly to an area and then hang out a whole bunch and, um, and that was really cool. Um, this year, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more of a challenge um, kind of given that we're on Zoom a lot. And so um, there's a, a awesome advantage to being able to just sort of be around people and to um, just learn by overhearing conversations. And so that's something that we had to look for ways to sort of um, compensate for. Um, probably another big difference, um, and I actually really love this, is so um, last year and this year too, uh, our themes have been um, very sort of focused and relevant, right? And um, in my opinion, uh, it gives people sort of a rally cry, right? Like, you know, um, and I know we'll talk about last year later on, but, you know, like we were in the middle of the pandemic and we were doing things that were actually um, helping some of the people that had maybe lost their job um, as part of COVID. And um, that was a really cool um, and uniting feeling um, for everyone that was in IU. You know, you kind of hinted at this when the first, uh, I guess, five iterations of Indeed University, um, the program was really open to just any idea at all that you have for anything, as long as it's helping people get jobs. And that that led to a lot of creativity, but I'm, I'm a big believer that constraints uh, force more innovation and creativity when you when you put uh some some sort of guardrails around something that people have to come up with with really interesting ideas around them and so this year's focus specifically was around helping indeed with our our own hiring and um there were a number of different ideas that that came up around how we're doing scheduling and coordination but also things like reducing bias in the hiring process and how to improve the candidate experience can you, can you talk about how this year's class, who had just been through being recruited themselves, 
how did they make the switch to to the other side and yeah. and, and approach thinking about these different problems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about uh, the scheduling and coordination uh, piece first. So to your point, they were all somewhat familiar with uh, that because they had just been on the other side. Um, but as you know, and a lot of the uh, folks uh, at Indeed know, um, right now we have some super aggressive hiring goals, right? And we can't hire fast enough. And um, so these IUers were, you know, we just uh, sort of started to shadow and they would just sit, you know, like with a recruiter or, you know, a coordinator and just kind of like be a fly on the wall. Like, let me just watch what you do and, you know, let me ask some questions. And uh, something really interesting sort of emerged um, in the coordination space. Um, one of the coordinators had shared that uh, she actually um, leaves interviews on the table every day, meaning I should have scheduled these interviews, but I couldn't because I ran out of time because this process is so cumbersome um, and it's also so error prone, right? And you would think something like scheduling an interview, it's like one of those things you kind of take for granted and it's like, surely that's easy to do. Um, but it's actually a lot more complex, especially um, on the tech side of the org when we need to find calibrated interviewers and we have panels and um, things like that. So one of the teams uh, sought to uh, start to um, to solve that problem. And, uh, you know, they they effectively, um, the product's called Skywalker, it's very cool. Um, they effectively um, automated a lot of this process and it reduced the time that it takes a coordinator to schedule an interview by 25 to 50%. Um, and so that was just a really cool um, uh, sort of like way to sort of approach and, and solve that problem. Um, as far as, so the, the second question you ask about uh, reducing bias, uh, we had a, a specific team that was super interested in how do we reduce uh, bias, um, specifically unconscious bias from our hiring pipeline, right? So we have a whole pipeline and they chose to focus on the very, um, the very top of this funnel uh, with uh, resume screening. So the hypothesis is there's certain information that may have some unconscious bias attached to it. As an example, gender, maybe nationality, um, you get to deeper into stuff like schools, um, location, and they started with gender. And so the hypothesis is, if we blind any information that might tell me that someone, is, you know, someone's gender, would we see more representation in that second pile um, than we would when we don't blind that information? And this team did a ton of work in this space, and uh, the results that we need a little bit more data. Uh, before we can, uh, you know, conclusively feel that um, that we have a, an answer to this, but uh, I think some of the cool things that sort of came from that, and, and Chris, like I know you talked about it, but it really sparked a lot of conversations um, between um, you and like Lowell and and you and Scott Bono, who is our VP of Talent Acquisition, um, who kindly offered to take this project and move it forward um, after IU. One of the great parts about IU, and I, I always describe it at the start when I meet with the um, the whole cohort, that this, this is really my favorite time of year, and indeed is my favorite thing. And um, I have been uh, involved in, in every single Indeed indeed You and meet with every single one of the teams on a, on a regular basis. And then at the end, uh, they get to come and, and pitch to the senior leaders um, their project uh, if they've discovered something that they feel like we should continue to invest in. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the pitches that that came out at the end and and you know what stuck with you? Yeah, so um, first off, like all the pitches were awesome. Uh, it's really cool to watch. Um, but you know some of the ones that stuck with me, we have five teams that are actually going to uh, their product will live on outside of IU. They'll, they'll go to their teams. But of course, like the the resume blinding uh, one, uh, we had one uh, Skywalker, so the coordination tool. Um, there was a, another team uh, who cleverly named themselves Badger uh, because they remind people like, hey, you haven't responded to this uh, interview request. Um, and then also started to track that information. So there were some really um, interesting ones uh, within that space are, are really innovative ways to think about the problem. Um, but again, uh, to your point, Chris, like. It was like, you know, one of my favorite moments and I feel really privileged to be there. Um, they all did such a great job and it reminds me, and I felt this way last year too, um, I coached my son's uh, baseball team and this is the first year you play baseball. 
And, you know, like we would go in between games and practice, you know, I would just like throw to him and, you know, uh, just like some batting practice. And um, I remember uh, one of the games we were at after we had practiced a good bit, um, he made contact with the ball and just, you know, cracked it out of the park. It was beautiful. And I had that same feeling whenever I'm watching the IUers do their pitch. It's like, I feel like pride is an understatement for the way I feel because it feels like my heart is going to come out of my chest. It was just really incredible. That's beautiful. Um, so the focus, as, as, as I said in the start and, and, and you reinforced, really the, the number one goal is, is on uh, instilling this idea of how to use data to, to make decisions. Um, but as you also pointed out, it's really about learning, um, learning new things for, for both the, the participants and, and for the leaders. Can you talk uh, a little bit about how you think about the sort of learning environment of Indeed University? Yeah, so um, Chris, again, I think that one of the the value props uh, of Indeed University is this, it's like a very safe environment, right? You have a lot of support. It's totally okay to, to fail. Failure isn't failure, it's learning, right? And then, you know, like for a lot of folks, you know, like it, let's just look at our participants. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, folks, they, they just got out of college and, you know, they've been hand-selected the same way that our leads have, right? Like our leads are, um, are shooting stars at Indeed. And so we know that both of these groups have the potential to do well. And then we put them into an environment to where they can take that potential and marry it up with opportunity. Um, I was actually thinking the other day that what I see both leads and participants go through reminds me of, uh, in the army, they have these confidence courses. And, um, one of the, uh, exercises you do in the confidence course, it's like a 30 foot tower and, um, you have to climb to the top and then go over the top and then go back down. And I remember getting there and looking at that thing and saying like, uh, uh-uh, uh, that's not me. <laughs> like, there's no way. Um, but then you do it and then you're like, wow, like I did that. I, you know, who knows what I can do. And you kind of see that same thing happen. You know, it's like a little bit of nerves. I think I can do it. And then they have an opportunity to prove to themselves that they can actually do it. And so they have, um, the, uh, potential, uh, they have the opportunity, uh, and then they're able to prove it to themselves that they can do it. And so then they have the confidence. So, so you just sort of slipped a bit of information in there. I'd, I'd love to actually talk a little bit more about it. So to, 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 to step aside from, from IU for a second, you, you have, uh, like my career a little bit of a nonlinear path getting to, to where you are today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got to, to, to tech and, and in particular, you mentioned about your military service? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will walk you through a little bit of my career. And then what I want to do is just kind of share some of the lessons that, uh, that I learned, um, you know, going through, um, my career up until this point. So I served in the military. I was in the army, uh, from 2000 to 2004. And my first, uh, duty station was, uh, in South Korea, about 50 miles, uh, south of, uh, Seoul. And, um, I was stationed there for about a year, <clears throat> excuse me, I was stationed there for about a year and then uh, after returning to the States, uh, quickly deployed uh, to Kuwait in response to uh, the 9-11 attacks under Operation Enduring Freedom. So in the army, um, everybody is a soldier first. And uh, so in that context, I was a soldier that was part of the chaplain corps who was trained to look out for the psychological and spiritual needs of the unit in which I was attached to. So in Kuwait, um, w- you know, one thing to kind of share is that a lot of soldiers are very young, right? Like a lot of them joined right out, right out of high school. Um, they're like the age of maybe, you know, like the, the last IU cohort, right? Early twenties. Um, a lot of them have uh, new families, um, you know, uh, you know, they're newly married and they are faced with feelings of um, their own mortality uh, in those environments, especially. And um, oftentimes feelings of loneliness because they're separated from their families for such a long time and uh, communication uh, can be very difficult when you are deployed. And so, um, you know, in that context of my job, uh, uh, you know, the first lesson that I learned, Chris, was that listening is the most important part. 
Um, in those situations, you can imagine someone having those feelings and they're totally valid. And also there really isn't very much advice you're gonna be able to give someone that's gonna make that feel different. Um, those are real feelings. And um, I found that the best way to serve someone is for them to feel heard and seen and for someone to witness their experience. The second lesson that I learned um, while being in the military is um, people are your greatest assets. So the army had this really interesting way of looking at soldiers. They saw them as assets, no different than their tanks and their helicopters. And um, from their perspective, we paid money to recruit you and we paid money to train you and to clothe you and to feed you and to house you. And um, they want their asset to be taken care of. And their expectation is that their leaders would take care of that asset the same way that they would take care of a helicopter or a tank. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit and talk about um, my time um, with uh, Zappos. Um, uh, so uh, after the military from like 2005 to 2013, um, <clears throat> I joined Zappos and it, at the time it was like a super uh, small startup, right? Like I don't remember how many people were there, but I remember that we fit on one floor of a small building and you could stand up and pretty much see everybody. And um, while I was there, there were, uh, Zappos was kind of getting a lot of attention for being a, a really happy place to work. And it was in the, you know, Fortune 500s and, you know, people would do interviews and they would always ask the question, what makes this place so happy? And um, the answer that was often given was our culture. So the question is, what is culture? Uh, culture is um, values plus behaviors, right? And the value that I feel like really kind of made that such an awesome place to work, because I was truly happy when I worked there, was there was 360 um, psychological safety. And what I mean by psychological safety is, um, Everybody feels safe to say, um, I don't, I don't get it. Um, I need help. Uh, I made a mistake. Um, and, uh, Zappos was also a very traditional startup in the sense that, uh, one it's very expensive to run brick and mortars and, uh, we could barely make enough money, um, to, uh, stay afloat. And, um, I, my opinion is that the reason that Zappos was able to be successful up until the uh, Amazon acquisition uh, was because you would not believe how much work you can get done when you're not thinking about any of those things, right? When you're not worried about, um, wait, I've got to like pretend like I didn't just mess something up or I've got to pretend like I know something when I actually don't. And so um, you just get work done, right? And so that brought me to my uh, second lesson which was psychological safety makes people go. Moving forward a little bit, uh, after Zappos, I spent a few years at a company called Riot Games. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Riot, they make a game called League of Legends, um, Legends of Ruterra, and um, Valorant. And um, I met some of the most talented people uh, that I've ever met while I worked at Riot Games. And Riot is very similar to um, Indeed or Google in the sense that um, they hired for top talent, right? So they would get the best illustrators, the best animators, the best game designers. Um, and uh, I also, unfortunately, that was the first time I ran into toxic leadership. And if anyone is curious about what I mean, just Google Riot Games Culture and, and you can kind of get an idea of uh, some of the stuff that I was observing and experiencing. Um, but kind of going back to uh, the way that the army looked at its people's assets. Um, Riot Games has all these assets that they, you know, have recruited and, you know, trained and, you know, they've uh, paid top dollar for. And I was observing how this toxic leadership was like pouring sugar into a gas tank of a Ferrari. You would have this like high performer that all of a sudden was um, not able to operate anymore. And so that kind of left me with a little bit um, of an obsession for understanding uh, what does good leadership look like and, um, and what's important. And then it's kind of like this image burned in my head of what happens when you um, not only have a void of good leadership, you have toxic leadership. So, um, you know, one thing that's super interesting is 
so much of this job, while well, well, your job as a as a product manager is, uh, you know, at its core, it's a it's a technical thing. But really, everything that we do is all about people. And so, you've had this interesting path and and done uh, different things. How, how does that set of broad set of experiences that you have, you think, um, served you as as a dean of Indeed University? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the thing that I have been thinking about a lot lately is, um, especially as like a dean, as like a leader and a leader of leaders, um, I used to think that uh, I used to have a fixed mindset. And so like I believed that um, any skill you just kind of, you're good at or you're bad at, right? Like you're probably always good at playing the drums, right? Um, and that's not true. Um, leadership is a skill like any other skill, right? And if you want to grow it, you have to intentionally go out and you have to grow that skill, right? You have to put time into it, like working out, you gotta work out that muscle if you want it to grow. What I've observed is that with, um, what often happens is you have high performing individual contributors and they just sort of, you know, they rise up and then a reward for getting to a certain level is that you then become a people manager. Um, but there isn't oftentimes a signal that says like, hey, there's actually a new skill that you need to, um, to go learn. And so oftentimes what you'll find is a spectrum. Uh, there's a book I was reading recently called The Manager's, Manager's Path. And it describes that oftentimes uh, a large majority of people, um, they don't necessarily have a bad manager, they have a benign manager. So they're not hurting you, but also they're not doing anything to help you there. So that's like a one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum is a manager that actually does a ton of damage. Um, so one of the things that we did in IU this year, um, so in the past we've, we've had some leadership training around competency, uh, sorry, um, uh, compliance, sorry. Um, and the compliance training was around, uh, hey, you know, this is what FMLA is and don't be weird. Um, and this year we sort of added an additional element to it um, that was around, okay, here's some things that really matter as you're leading people. You know, to be a good leader, you need to create psychological safety. This is what it is, this is why it matters. Here's some tips to do it. Um, here's some books that you can go read that can help you on your journey. Um, this is what empathy is, this is why it matters. Um, this is how to start to do that. And here are some things that you can do to start to um, build out that skill set. I've had the uh, pleasure of getting to work with Indeed You over all of these years, um, but you have experience at, at least in the last two years and, and every IU class is definitely different and unique and they, they bring their own sort of set of perspectives and experiences. What, what struck you about this year of, of IU compared to um, what you've seen in the past? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, so the similarities are, they're really awesome. Just like the, the class was last year, just like, um, you know, like I, I look at these participants and I think, I don't think I looked like that when I was your age. <laughs> like I did not have it together, like what you do. But a thing that I've been thinking of a lot uh, recently and um, a lot of that uh, I believe um, comes from um, I have kids that are part of Gen Z and a lot of these participants are part of Gen Z. Um, I'm, I'm a millennial myself. And then Chris, you're probably what, Gen X? I'm, I'm solidly Gen X. Awesome. Uh, so I think it's very interesting that, um, so these are all um, uh, blanket statements, right? They're generalizations, but it is very interesting that uh, your uh, experience, which is informed by culture, uh, at a certain age um, where you are um, able to sort of take in new information um, will influence your perspective on the world. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed is that um, there's a slightly different perspective on things. And I, I love that. Like, I love the challenge of it. And um, I, I want to just kind of call it a, a few things that I've noticed. And again, these are generalizations, but I've noticed that with a lot of uh, Gen Zers, they um, have a lot less tolerance for a lack of representation. Um, they have a lot less tolerance for any kind of a bias. Um, and they're very aware of microaggressions. And um, so you can have a blind spot, right? Um, but the thing I wanna talk about are more like blurry spots. Um, so I wanna give you an example. I, there's been several times uh, in my career, and I've noticed this uh, as of late, 
Uh, as an example, you're in a meeting, someone says something and you just kind of have a feeling like something about that felt weird to me, something felt off, but I don't have words for what that was. Um, so I'm certainly not gonna say anything about it. And um, the thing is they do though, uh, they have words for it. They have a name for it, they'll call it out and they're not afraid to say it. And I love this because it, one, gives me a language for whatever reason, that's a blind or a blurry spot for me. Gives me a language and then also it gives me courage because they're so courageous that I think I can be like them. I can speak up and say something. That's fantastic. Um, so last year around this time on uh, Here to Help, I had Heather Wood as a guest uh, who was the, the dean of uh, IU last year, one of the deans of IU last year. Um, and talking really about, because that was, that was sort of the big pivot from how do we take something that we used to do in person and and make it fully remote. Um, we've talked about the fact that some of these, because you were fully remote this year, some of these issues, um, you know, uh, carried over into this year. What what were some of the impacts on on this year's class of of having to figure out how to work together remotely? Yeah. So um, first off, uh, you know, hats off to Heather and Neek and Trace. They worked so hard. Like last year, there was so much uncertainty. And from my perspective, at a minimum, they carved a path. And it's like, if you just follow this path, you're gonna be okay. And then if you wanna do some improv along the way, that's fine, but here's a path for success. And so I'm super grateful that they did that. And they also took a lot of time to capture learnings and make sure that this class and you know myself, you know, that we were all aware of it. Um, but some of the things that, you know, I think persist and um, this is, you know, of course, like a, a barrier with technology is um, communication is hard, right? Like so much of our communication comes from just overhearing a conversation or running into someone in the hallway. It's like more uh, informal. Um, and those are hard to do. Uh, like on Zoom, you're setting up a direct call. You have to have your questions ready. You can't just like, you know, run into someone, you know, in the break room on Zoom. Um, and uh, the other thing, and this was really, um, this came up a lot in the skip reviews, but um, people really had this deep desire to be able to connect to the other people that were part of the program. Um, to connect in like, I guess like more of a, a traditional way, like just being you know, around another human being. And this experience of IU, it's so, um, it's so uh, jam-packed and it's so intense that you end up having this bond with people that you really just kind of want to appreciate in a different way, right? And so, like I know for me, I've seen uh, mostly everyone that I met through IU, I've only ever known them on Zoom. So you have this like desire of like, I really just wanna see them. And I've I've seen two people that I went to IU with and it's such a an awesome feeling. Like I don't, I don't really even know how to compare it to anything else, but I know that for a lot of the participants and definitely for myself, I can't wait until we are able to share a meal or a coffee or just run into each other in the hallway. On a personal level, so you're mother of four kids. Can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic has affected um, you and your family personally? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, first though, I wanted to say that I loved the campaign that we did. I guess it was two years ago now where it was like our 15th anniversary and you got to upload a picture of yourself when you were 15. Um, the picture that I uploaded was actually a picture of me and my wife uh, when I was 15. And um, it, we didn't get married till way, way later. We were never you know, in a relationship. And then five years ago that happened and three years ago we got married. And so I love the framing of the best is yet to come, right? Um, I'm living you know, that best right now, but um, as far as having kids, like, so um, lots of people get into parenting gradually. <laughs> you know, you got time to warm up and get ready for it. But, you know, um, uh, Stephanie and I got married and I became a mom right away to four kids. And, you know, uh, naturally your perspective starts to shift. You're usually thinking about, you know, yourself and maybe yourself and one other person. But now you're thinking about four other people that you, you're responsible for. So there's a lot of feelings that I have that I feel like I, I probably wouldn't have felt as strongly uh, before the pandemic. Um, as an example, I feel uh, grateful that I have job stability. I feel grateful that I have the kind of job where I can work from home 
And we have an option to have our kids homeschool if we're concerned about their their health and safety at the school, right? Um, Stephanie often reminds me that, so before we were married, she was a, a single mom and this wouldn't have been an option for her, right? And then I also feel, um, you know, scared for their their uh, safety um, and well-being, right? So it's it's a thing that you end up um, thinking about uh, thinking about a lot. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, I I could keep talking uh, for for another hour easily. There's so much to to cover, but um, just to, to to wrap up the way that I, I always like to bring these conversations to a close is sort of looking ahead. You know, with with all of the challenges. And, and all of the the extreme difficulties that people around the world have faced uh, throughout this pandemic. What, from your perspective, um, has happened or what have you experienced that gives you some optimism for the future? Yeah, so uh, the past like 18 months, there, there's been a lot of things that are not awesome. And it's super easy to kind of get focused on those things and forget about some of the good things. There's a quote, and the quote is, the light shines in the darkness, the darkness does not overcome it. And I think about that a lot when I've seen people just doing some of the kindest things. I'll give you an example. My wife works in foster care and adoption. And a couple weeks ago, I got to uh, witness an adoption uh, for this girl that was turning 18 in a week. And um, for context, when you turn 18, you're kind of like, you've aged out of the adoption age, right? You can do an adult adoption, but it's very different, right? And they did not care. They loved this girl. She was part of their family and they wanted to make it official. So it's good to remember um, things like that. The second thing is um, uh, one of my favorite shows that has got me through the pandemic is Ted Lasso. I would highly recommend season one, uh, wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, season two, but it's, if Please watch it. It is super um, just sort of wholesome and there's a lot of like great uh, lines from it. But um, one of the lines he says is, um, uh, back home we have a saying, uh, do you believe in miracles? And um, the story I'm about to tell you makes sense if you do believe in miracles. So um, about six months ago when we were interviewing leads, our uh, oldest kid who's 14 and has some neurodiversity uh, had a moment of frustration and they left our house in the middle of the night um, and they told us that their goal was to just be gone for a couple hours and come home but they walked so far for so long that they got lost and they were missing for four days and as a parent it is just an unnerving feeling to wake up and realize one of your children is gone they're missing and so you know for four days my wife and i are you know, we're doing our math and trying to figure out, you know, how, how fast could they be walking? And we've created a perimeter and you're just driving up and down the roads trying to find your kid, right? And we're showing, you know, pictures and talking to all their friends. And we were really um, fortunate to have so many people that were um, wanted to help us, right? They're sending food. Let me help you find your kid. And one of the people that was so helpful um, is actually an Adidian uh, named Mindy Krupp. Um, one thing you should know about Mindy is she's an absolute force of nature. If you want something done, give it to Mindy and just get it done. So Mindy had been very helpful throughout this whole thing, but I want to talk about the, the last day. Uh, so Mindy had offered to create flyers for us. And um, uh, so she's, we're going to meet, we're going to, we're going to start passing them out. And she goes to print it and her home printer doesn't work. So then she goes to Walgreens and Walgreens printer doesn't work. So now she's got to go to Office Depot. She doesn't know where it's at, so she's got her GPS pulled up and she's driving around trying to find it. And it uh, gets her into a parking lot and in which she was like, this is all weird. And then it points down an alley and she looks down the alley and there's our kid. And when we were reunited, we asked our kid, you know, how, you know, we know that you left with $5. How have you been eating this whole time? You know, like, have you been starving? What's been going on? And they told us that strangers had been giving them money. And people in restaurants had been bringing, uh, bringing them food. And so the thing that makes me optimistic, Chris, is I do believe in the goodness of people and I do believe in miracles. Wow, that's, that's an extraordinary story. Um, thank you for sharing that, Lori. And uh, thank you for, for joining me today. Um, 
what an amazing conversation. Uh, I, I really, um, I look forward to, to talking more and hearing more of these stories, but thank you also just for everything that you do every day to help people get jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.